Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, this webinar, uh, a discussion uh, between Nick Bryant and David Reynolds. It's an enormous pleasure to welcome so many friends um, and visitors uh, this evening. Um, the focus is on Nick Bryant's new book, When America Stopped Being Great. Um, and uh, in a few moments, uh, David is going to lead uh, the discussion with Nick on that. Both Nick and David are great assets and supporters of the college, and it's a real pleasure to have them uh, with us. Nick was a star history undergraduate um, and uh, almost an all-conquering football captain um, in Churchill in the late 1980s. Um, he then went over to the, the dark side. He went to Oxford and did a DPhil in American politics. And it was from there that he proceeded to his career in the BBC as a political journalist of, to my mind, exceptional um, insight and creativity. His copy is always compelling, and he has posted it from all over the globe, from locations uh, right across uh, the world, including Washington, South Asia, Sydney. Um, Sydney has left an indelible um, mark on his otherwise previously impeccable Bristolian accent, and I know that he's really pleased about um, the Australian imprint. Um, he's now, as many of you will know, the BBC's New York correspondent, an, an extraordinary position to be in, at an extraordinary time. And it's that vantage point, I think, that has really provided um, uh, the heart of his wonderfully readable new book, um, which explores the deep origins of uh, Donald Trump's uh, emergence, his election, uh, and his presidency. Nick wrote two excellent earlier books, um, The Bystander about JFK uh, and Black Equality and Confessions from Correspondent Land. David Reynolds, FBA, um, educated at Cambridge and Harvard, is Emeritus Professor of International History at the University of Cambridge. And he's a long-standing and key member of the Churchill Archives Committee. He's also provided really good counsel and the most generous uh, encouragement and support to many historians in this college and right across uh, Cambridge and elsewhere over many years. David is a superlative uh, historian, uh, a writer and broadcaster. Um, his work is immensely rigorous and it's also hugely approachable. And that's a very difficult thing to achieve. It's a rare thing. Uh, I think it's rooted in what to my mind is uh, his amazing historical imagination. And the, the whole idea of historical imagination is something that he's talked to me about many times and which I think is, 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 is so important, so interesting. He's written so many books. Um, the one that I would point to from a personal perspective as an absolute highlight is his prize winning in Command of History, which is his great book on Churchill writing the history um, of the Second World War, um, which I think is one of the great history books, actually. But perhaps most relevant to this discussion are his Radio 4 series, um, America, Empire of Liberty, and the accompanying book, which he's currently uh, rewriting and which is about to be uh, republished, um, of course, updated to uh, reflect uh, such uh, extraordinary recent developments in American history. So Nick and David are going to discuss Nick's new book uh, before responding to questions. We're going to do those via the Q&A function, function in Zoom. So if you would please post your questions in the q and I'll have a look at them as we go along. And then when the discussion comes to a close, then we'll move to the questions which I will um, introduce. So thank you everyone and uh, over to David and Nick. Well, thank you, Richard. Um, and Nick, it's great to, to talk about your book and my perspectives on some aspects of it that we'll be talking through. Um, can you wait, just wave a copy of the book just so people know it's for real? Great picture on the cover, great title, When America Stopped Being Great. Um, as Richard said, uh, Nick, combines the skills of a journalist and the insights of a journalist, the eye for um, uh, you know, the telling uh, vignette, the, the pithy quote, with the fact that he has a, a, a doctorate in history, uh, though not unfortunately a Cambridge doctorate, but we won't discuss that. Um, and it's a really good read, this book, and it has a historical perspective. Those two things, the journalism and the history come together. It's also got some wonderful phrases in it. Um, uh, one I enjoyed was um, Donald Trump's signature uh, looks rather like a, a seismograph uh, during a medium-sized earthquake. And the description of Bill Clinton as an all-you-can-eat buffet kind of candidate. Um, and there are many more like that, really, really good fun. So it's a good read as well. Um, what we want to talk about is, is, is 
Nick's take on the recent past, um, the last uh, few years, but also on his larger thesis about where this all sits within the contours of American history. And we both got views on this. So we'll be talking about recent things and then widening the perspective. Um, Nick, do you want to just start by giving us a feel for this book and the, the trajectory of it? It starts with mourning in America, it ends with an America, American carnage. So you get a quick sense there that you know, something's happened really. Yeah, David, first of all, let me say thank you so much for taking part in this conversation. You are one of the great American historians. Any North America correspondent for the BBC has relied very heavily over the years on your work on the special relationship. And Empire of Liberty is regarded rightly as one of the great single volume American history. So it's great to be with you. I'm really looking forward to the update. I know you're working on a Trump chapter and an Obama chapter as we speak. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. To Churchill College, it is wonderful to come back home. Uh, Churchill is my academic home. I spent four wonderful years there. They were some of the happiest years in my life. As Richard alluded, a lot of that time was spent on the sports field. I was very proud to Captain Churchill. Uh, to the championship back in 1987, we played nine games. We won nine games. I think we scored 45 goals and led in six. We were a, a real powerhouse of a soccer team. Uh, alas, a few months later, uh, it was me who missed the penalty in the Cuppers final that cost us the double. I still can see that ball uh, in my mind, flying over the bar and heading from Grange Road in the direction of King's College Chapel. The, the scar tissue is still forming on that. Um, to those outside of the Churchill community and the Cambridge community, thank you so much uh, for letting me and for letting us come into your living rooms. I never take that for granted. It's something we get to do quite a lot as BBC correspondents. I promise you, um, we never take that for granted. Churchill College was really set up to demolish the Ivy Towers. Um, the whole point was to try and bring academic discussion and scientific research and scholarship into the British mainstream. And I really hope that this event tonight really follows in that tradition. And just finally, before I get onto the book, I just want to say a word to the undergraduates and the students that are tuning in. My heart really goes out to you. Um, this is not the undergraduate experience that we wanted you to have. This is not the undergraduate experience that you richly deserve. But hopefully, Things are going to change. Things are going to get better. And I promise you, a golden harvest awaits at the end. You will get to enjoy Cambridge, hopefully, in the same way that people like David and I have got to enjoy Cambridge over the years. Um, as for the book, um, as you say, um, it is really an exclamation trying to make sense of how we got to where we are right now. The rise of Donald Trump, the fact that the United States of America has become the disunited states of America. And in search of traceable origins, David, I could have gone back uh, to the founding days of the Republic. I mean, 1776 was the chant of the pro-Trump mob that stormed the US Capitol. They fervently believed they were acting in the revolutionary spirit of, the, uh, of those times. We could take you through the battlefields of the Civil War and show you that division has been the default setting throughout so much of American history, and especially division based upon the angriest fault line of all, which has always been race. But I decided to trace it back to the beginning of my American journey. My American journey began in 1984. I was 16 years old. I was two years away from coming up to Churchill. And I managed to cobble together the money to fly over to Los Angeles on the eve of the Olympics. And it was this extraordinary summertime of resurgence. The opening ceremony, 84 pianists bashed out Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue on 84 grand pianos. A, a rocket man jetted into the LA Coliseum with a jetpack affixed, affixed to his back. It was so Hollywood. And then, of course, we saw the modern day gold rush of this multiracial team of American athletes just mopping up because of the Soviet boycott. They won so many medals. McDonald's that year had a scratch card promotion. If, America won a gold in a certain event, you got a Big Mac. If they won a silver, you got fries. If they got bronze, you got a drink. And I just feasted on free junk food the entire summer. And every time I hear the chart USA, USA, I, I really expect somebody to hand me a free burger. And of course, later that year, Ronald Reagan, who was the president at the time, won re-election with that ringing slogan, it's morning again 
in America, a slogan that just perfectly encapsulated the optimistic spirit of the times. And of course, he won 49 out of 50 states. He almost got the 50-50 clean sweep. If there hadn't been for a few thousand votes in Minnesota, he would have actually pulled that off. And so the book became an exploration of how we went from its morning again in America to the American carnage of Donald Trump's inaugural address. I watched it unfold from 50 yards away on the press riser. And then it ends with the mass mourning of the coronavirus outbreak. And its final coda is that extraordinary moment on January the 6th, the storming of the US Capitol. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting what you say. I mean, I have a sense here of reading your book and what you've just said of a feeling of um, a personal sense of loss uh, about what's happened. And I share this in a way. I, I, I first went to the States in 1973 and uh, didn't know quite what I was going to get. Uh, in the end, I, I got a wife, which was more than I expected. And um, uh, that's been wonderful. But uh, traveling around America, I just found it so liberating to be in a country where somehow one's own past, one's own class position, all those kind of things that mattered a lot in Cambridge didn't matter at all. Um, and like you, I've had this sense of increasing sadness and disillusion with where America has got to in the last few years. And that's part of my reason for being willing to re, you know, to write a new part to America, Empire of Liberty. I wanted to try and understand what had happened since Obama kept, became president and try and work out what I got right, what I got wrong, because like you, there was a, a real sense. I hadn't properly seen Trump coming. I understood this was a polarized country, but the Trump phenomenon uh, left uh, me surprised. And as you say, very candidly and very honestly in the book, it, 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 it surprised you. So, um, so I think for both of us, this is quite a personal exploration. And that's part of why I think it, it's fun, fun to do it. Um, okay, so let's, let's start with um, uh, Barack Obama. When I was doing the radio series, um, America Empire of Liberty, which was done with a team from Radio 4 Current Affairs, not documentaries, the people there said, um, look, we're going to be finishing the, the very recent episodes of the series some weeks after Obama's been inaugurated. So maybe we should just be you know, catching up on the latest news. And I said, no, absolutely not. Anything I say about you know, the news this week will be changed next week and so on. The one thing I can be clear on as a historian is that Obama has made his ensured his place in history on day one because there is there is the image of a, a podium saying president of the united states with the seal on it and behind it is a man who does not have a white face that's his place in history and i think that i got that bit right what i'm curious about now and this is where i want to get your take is is there a sense that Obama's presidency was a disappointment after day one? And if so, to what do you put that down? How do you explain it? David, I think you're absolutely right. The fact that he became president in racial terms was actually more significant in the end than his eight year presidency. Uh, as you say, that dramatic sight. I was in Washington the night he got elected. Washington is a very sleepy city, as you know. It's, it's a place where passions tend to converge rather than originate. Mm. The mood in Washington that night was just extraordinary because it is primarily an African-American city. And the idea that a white house that was built by slaves would be occupied with a white, by a black man was galvanizing and beautiful for so many people, African-Americans especially, who converged on Lafayette Square that night, the square opposite the White House. It was almost as mentally they'd already evicted its occupant that night, George W. Bush. So many hopes were vested in the presidency of Barack Obama. There was this hope that he would bring about a post-racial society. There was hope that he could bring about a post-partisan 
America. There was this hope that he would renew American leadership in the world because for so many people, he personified the idea of American renewal and American rebirth. There was this hope that he could not just save the US economy, that he could fix the US economy as well. I think on the post-racial front, I mean, Obama himself knew that that was just gonna be beyond him. I think he obviously didn't want his presidency to be defined by his pigmentation. He'd never talked about his candidacy as a progression of the civil rights movement. He never saw it in those historical terms. In fact, he had downplayed his race throughout his candidacy. And he also saw the need to downplay his race when he became presidency, president. And I think that was a missed opportunity, David. I don't think you got the kind of set piece race speech during his presidency that you had got during the campaign. You remember when his candidacy was jeopardized by Jeremiah Wright's fiery sermons, his old pastor from um, Chicago. Obama delivered this extraordinary speech in Philadelphia, exploring the complexity of race in America and his mixed race background and how his personal narrative explained many of the contradictions in American life. It was an extraordinary speech, but he didn't replicate that as president. And that may be a mistake. Now, You'll have read his memoir like I have. He said, whenever I spoke about race, my white approval ratings went down. But arguably, that's more of a reason to talk about race. You know, he accepted that reality rather than challenging that reality. And I think that was why his presidency, in some ways, on the racial front, was disappointing. In terms of post-partisanship, I think he was more optimistic on that front. I mean, his breakthrough speech, obviously, in 2004 at the Democratic Convention in Boston, spoke not of a red state America and a blue state America, a United States of America. And he really thought he could actually pull that off. But immediately, he obviously gets confronted by this wall of opposition by the Republican Party. On the very night that he was inaugurated, a group of Republicans got together in a Washington restaurant, the caucus room. They were joined by Newt Gingrich, who's one of the great godfathers of uh, polarization, of former Republican House Speaker, of course. And they really set out to destroy the Obama presidency. So too did Mitch McConnell. He said the single aim is to make Obama a one-term president. And early on in the rescue package, you know, it just doesn't attract any Republican support. And Obama is surprised by that. But obviously it set the tone. American politics has just become so polarized by that stage that he just wasn't gonna pull that off. In terms of the economy, I think, you know, he did save it in many ways, um, as did the Bush administration in its final months. I think the problem for Obama was that he didn't manage to fix the American economy. He didn't manage to sort out the structural imbalance that has created such a huge disparity in wealth in this country. I mean, one of the arguments of the book is that political polarization has got, gone hand in hand with income polarization. And so many of the income gains during the Obama presidency were concentrated in that 1%, concentrated in that top 5%. And one of the things that I noticed after a 10 year break of away from America, and I, I totally agree with everything you've said about the sense of possibility that you experienced as a, as a, as a student traveling here, is exactly the thing I felt. I felt unshackled by America. I'd always felt quite weighed down by the class system in Britain. I, said, I felt this sense of possibility in America that I hadn't felt in, at home, and frankly, my, my parents said that trip was transformational. I came back afterwards, I decided to apply for Cambridge. You know, something frankly that kids from my school might not have done. You know, there wasn't a sense of a belief in upward mobility amongst my schoolmates that you found uh, with high school students in America. And the thing I noticed, David, was that so many people no longer believed back during the Obama years in the American dream. You know, this idea that their kids would lead more abundant lives than they had. That belief, that animating, belief had gone. And so when Donald Trump came along and said the American dream was dead, it resonated because so many people agreed with it. Mm -hmm. Do you think that Obama, I mean, Obama, as you say, had this feeling that he, he was not in a position as president to speak out on race in the way that he did as a candidate. But do you think he was in general a, a more cautious leader than he needed to be. Were there points at which he could have pushed against the obstructionism that he was facing from the Republicans? For example, on the question of, of trying to get through uh, Supreme Court Justice Merrick Garland, which he allowed Mitch McConnell to dictate 
uh, the obstruction for months uh, before the, the November election. So was there a certain cautiousness about his leadership or was that symptomatic of this general problem of being on the defensive about the racial issue? Mm. Uh, the idea took hold that uh, just as Obama was sort of fated to win the election in 2008, his presidency was doomed to um, fail um, and, and doomed to disappoint is a better way of putting it. Um, and the huge majorities that he had in the House, and obviously he had a super majority in the Senate, you know, those had gone within two years. And a sense historically has almost taken hold that that was preordained, that that was always going to happen, but it needn't have happened. There was nothing inevitable about that. And I think some of the missteps that Obama made contributed to that defeat. I don't think he pushed back strongly enough against that Republican obstructionism. He didn't play the Washington political game because he was so disdainful of the Washington political game. He speaks in his book about how he didn't invite Republican senators yeah. for a whiskey after work, I mean, he wanted to spend time with the family, which is entirely understandable. And the, he says the whiskey after work wouldn't 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 wash anyway, given the intransigence of the Republican opposition. And I'm sympathetic to that view, but it was almost if if he gave up. Mm. And of the eight years of the Obama presidency, I was struck, David, by how four of them were very listless. We got the faded poster of Obama, really, from 2010 to 2014. You know, he got a shellicking, as he described it in, in uh, the midterm elections two years after his presidency. And I think that really cowed him. And I think even though he renewed his mandate in 2012, you know, that was, again, a fairly listless beginning to his second term. It was only in his final two years yeah. when I think he was preoccupied with his legacy that you saw the energy, the re-energization of the Obama uh, administra administration. Look, I mean, a lot of problems with Obama. He didn't push back hard enough against the Republicans. Um, he didn't party build enough. I mean, at the time, the Republicans were just making hay at the local level, at the state level. You know, Obama left the Democratic Party in a terrible state. Um, institutionally, I think he had the assumption that the Obama machine would be taken over by the Clinton machine, that Clinton would protect his legacy. And of mm. course, that didn't happen. But on the other side, I mean, if you think of it from his position, he comes in with an absolutely cataclysmic financial crisis. And that takes months to deal with. Huge amount of energy goes into that. He then puts most of his political capital into health care, Obamacare, so that given that for most presidents, the first two years are the critical ones because you know you're going to do badly in the first midterms and it'll probably get worse from then on. A lot of his time is, is lost to the financial crisis. And then the Obamacare thing has not been rolled back by Trump, really, has it? No, it so has. those not achievements in their own way? They really are. And I say this in the book. I mean, this was one of the most consequential presidencies of the past 50 years. And I mean, Obama on healthcare obviously managed to do something that Truman hadn't managed to do, something that Kennedy hadn't managed to do, something that Lyndon Johnson hadn't managed to do, and of course, something that Bill and Hillary Clinton had not managed to do. That is such a, a dramatic achievement, and it's very high up in the first paragraph of his political obituary. Again, saving the US economy, at a time when many people thought they were going to go to their ATMs, put in their cards, and not be able to withdraw yeah. cash. I mean, there was that crisis of liquidity. Um, Wall Street was in meltdown. You know, Chuck Paulson, who was the Treasury Secretary uh, under Bush, literally went on his knees to beg congressional leaders to pass the rescue mm. package. Those two things are massive. The fact that cars are still built in Detroit, you know, a lot of that stems from Obama. Yeah, of course, it was a, a presidency of enormous achievement in the early days, but it was almost as if that two years of action and the fact that he was being hammered um, so relentlessly by the Republicans during that phase, and there was just no bipartisanship on these things, even yeah. though Obamacare was pretty similar to the healthcare reforms that the Republicans had put forward in the 90s. You know, I think it left him punch drunk to a certain extent. I think they pummeled him so much that, you know, it did take the steam out of his presidency. And, you know, like you say, inevitably, first term presidents do lose mm. in the House and in the Senate, but he lost big. Um, he had big majorities and they, they were just 
in the in the house they were they were they were gone he lost his super majority in the senate but um you know i think the the first two years really were obviously the two key years of the presidency but after that you know um it was a much less impressive presidency okay well we could talk much more about that but let's uh, let's move on to um uh what happened afterwards um uh, the um <coughs> You say very candidly in the book that, you know, you, in a sense, underestimated Donald Trump. I, I certainly did as well. Um, and what's interesting now is really trying to understand what we should have understood about the Trump presidency or Trump candidacy. Um, let me um, pick up on a couple of things you say in the book, which I think are quite revealing and useful and ask you to elaborate on them. So you make this interesting comment that Trump is a one man media conglomerate, a one man media conglomerate. Um, and he's also a vigilante candidate and indeed a president vigilante candidate. Now, can you just fill people in on what you mean by those two phrases, because I think they're quite helpful in, in thinking about Trump. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that has happened over the past 20 years in America, and one of the things that has contributed to the polarization is the way that the media landscape has changed in America. Donald Trump wasn't only sort of throwing or, or promising to throw a lifeline to the, the post-industrial landscape of the, the Rust Belt, he was really throwing a lifeline to the wasteland of the modern day media. And he understood the desperate straits they were in. He understood that he would be the ultimate clickbait candidate. He understood that he was a ratings winner. That first televised debate that was on Fox News, it got the biggest non-sports viewership ever on American cable television. He also understood that the traditional gatekeepers of news just didn't exert the same influence that they had done uh, over the past 50 years, because guess what? There were no gates anymore. Anybody could set up a website. Anybody could become a news organization. And that's what I mean when Donald Trump became a, a media conglomerate in his own right. I mean, obviously he had this reality TV presence, so a sort of traditional media presence, but he also realized very quickly the power of social media, the Facebook, the Twitter, you know, you look at Trump's Twitter account, in the end, it actually had far more followers than most news organizations in the United States of America. Uh, his Facebook account, similarly, it had a bigger reach than ABC, NBC, CBS. He became a media entity in his own right. And he also saw himself as this great content provider. Mm. And he understood his value to the media. And one of the great default settings on American TV in the 26th campaign was an was often a, a screen where <clears throat> there would be an empty podium with a countdown clock telling you when Trump was going to speak. He really understood that um, he was the ringmaster of this media circus and he didn't have to rely <clears throat> on the media, um, even though it gave him huge free airtime, you know, billions of dollars worth of free airtime. He realized that he was a media entity and a media organization in his own right because of Twitter and because of Facebook and how things have changed since he was deplatformed off Twitter. It, it feels like America is almost a different place. So what about the vigilante thing? Because that's part of the content provider, isn't it? It's the recognition that actually what gets news is regarded as newsworthy is uh, aggression, uh, hostility, uh, uh, temper tantrums, anything like that. Um, I mean, he understood, he's instinctively that kind of person perhaps, but he understood that as a kind of modus operandi as, as, as a political figure, right? Yeah, David, I think early on, the big analytical mistake that journalists made was to regard what we saw, uh, sorry, um, what we saw as weaknesses, his supporters saw as strengths. You know, when he went after John McCain, everybody in the media, the conventional wisdom was, this is a terrible misstep. You've gone after this great war hero. You've mm. gone after this great figure in the Republican party. But yeah. to his base, people saw John McCain as a figure of the establishment. They were fed up with people like Mitt Romney, John McCain, George W. Bush, George Herbert Walker Bush, 
uh, winning the nomination of the Republican Party. They wanted a change. They wanted an anti-establishment candidate who came from outside of that tradition. And they picked Donald Trump, of course. You know, when he started his campaign after coming down that golden escalator with an attack on Mexican immigrants. I mean, this came at a time when everybody in the Republican Party was saying, we need to expand our, our ethnic reach. We need to bring in Hispanic Americans. We face this demographic time bomb. We cannot just rely on the support of white Americans. We're going to need to broaden our racial appeal. And of course, so people looked at that start and thought that's disastrous. But of course, it was a stroke of political brilliance because there was enough white support out there to win him the presidency. It was concentrated in the states that he needed. So I think constantly we made this mistake that a vigilante candidate and a vigilante president would actually be off-putting, when actually it was absolutely at the heart of his appeal. Um, people loved the destructive energy that he brought to the campaign trail. They loved it when he talked about people being taken out of stretches and punched their lights out and all this kind of stuff. And they loved it when he became president as well. And remember, at the end of four years, 74 million people watched that presidency. They saw it operate for four years and they clicked very enthusiastically on the terms and conditions. Why? Because they loved the unconventionality of his presidency. I think that's absolutely key. They didn't want somebody who went to Washington and played by the normal rules. They want somebody to go to Washington and blow things up. Uh, whenever they saw him getting a bad press, they just agreed that it was the distorted fake news coverage of a liberal press. They also saw Donald Trump, somebody who made promises that were kept. You know, they loved the idea that he moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Lots of presidents have spoken about it, but it mm -hmm. Donald Trump to actually do it. You know, they liked the fact that he fought a trade war with China. Finally, somebody's sticking up for, for the worker against Beijing, even though people were being hurt by that, even though it was damaging people in their wallets. And I spent a lot of time in the Rust Belt and the Farm Belt talking about this to farmers and workers who were being punished by the trade war, but they still supported Donald Trump because they said somebody has to make a stand. You know, there was a record of right-wing accomplishment, David, as you know, the fact that he managed to get three Supreme Court justices yeah onto the Supreme Court. Um, that obviously was catnip to his evangelical supporters. And, you know, you look at the Trump presidency, it didn't produce the blue collar boom that he promised. Um, it didn't rectify so many of the sort of structural problems of the American economy that his, had provided the seabed for his candidacy. But so many people loved what they saw. And frankly, if it hadn't been for COVID, I think we would still be talking about a Trump presidency. Mm. He came very close, even with COVID, to winning. Just three states uh, uh, flipping would have actually thrown the election into the House of Representatives, and then he would have won because the Republicans control more state delegations. He came very close to winning, even though um, 500,000 people had died of, of COVID. And as I say, you know, so many people looked at that presidency, and it was exactly what they wanted. Mm. I mean, what was interesting was, you know, in terms of the underestimation uh, by Democrats, liberals, and what and many outside commentators was this sense that, you know, he was a man who was saying things which were demonstrably crazy. I remember thinking, um, you know, I, I thought about that business about building the wall on day one. And I thought to myself, you know, that is so clearly impossible when he fails to do it, surely that is going to um, puncture some of his credibility. It doesn't have any effect at all. You know, I mean, there's, there's pieces still in the paper now about the bits of the Trump wall, and, you know, all the rest of it. But you pick up and you and I've picked up on, I think, a, a very insightful line by a, um, uh, a Republican commentator um, who said during the 2016 campaign, uh, Selena Zito, I think she called, the press take him literally, not but not seriously. His supporters take him seriously, but not literally. In other words, as I understand it, that's about saying, you know, they don't believe he's going to build the wall on day one. But the great thing is he's saying, we're going to keep those people out. And it's a statement of, uh, you know, of, of belligerent defiance against this establishment against the threats to Americans so on. 
is that a, I, I mean you you you're struck by that quote as well I think aren't you it's, yeah it's, look it's, I, it's one of those quotes that you just wish you'd come up with yourself <laughs> yes it's brilliantly encapsulated this disconnect between the pundocracy in Washington that frankly didn't leave Washington enough you know people started reading books like Hillbilly Elegy to try and make sense of the Rust Belt rather than going to the Rust Belt itself and actually talking yeah. to viewers. you know I spent so much time in the Rust Belt in 2016 David I, I almost had to pay local taxes in Pittsburgh but whenever I left the Rust Belt I always felt that Hillary Clinton was going to win I felt that a lopsided win in the national popular vote would translate into an electoral college victory. I got that wrong. I really believe that the blue, the blue wall, as it was called, these states that have voted continuously uh, in the last sort of four or five cycles, Democrat would vote Democrat again. And of course, they included Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. I, I sort of made this pitch to my bosses the day before the election when I walked in the day after the first words of my boss were, what happened to the blue wall, mate? And <laughs> It disintegrated. Um, but yeah, I mean, there were so many paradoxes about the, the Trump presidency, how this sort of rich billionaire tycoon became this working class hero. But a lot of it was about negative partisanship, I think. Um, the hatred of the opposition. Negative partisanship has become such a driver now of polarization in America. It's not necessarily the devotion to your side, it's the hatred of the opposition. And Donald Trump really was a beneficiary of that. The Hillary hatred was so visceral. She really was seen as the personification of the political establishment. I also think that a, uh, the, the, the 21st century, a lot of the problems were pregnant in the 1990s and, and the presidency of Bill Clinton. You know, if you look at you know, he boasted about building a bridge to the 21st century, but for the Rust Belt, it felt more like a bypass. Oh. You know, mass incarceration was such a problem for, for black Americans. I think that depressed her turnout. His treatment of Monica Lewinsky, if you're looking at why Hillary Clinton did so poorly amongst women voters in 2016, and that was one of the reasons why she lost, um, I think it a lot stems from Bill Clinton's treatment of Monica Lewinsky and her support for Bill Clinton's treatment of Monica Lewinsky. So all of these things came to a head. But underlying a lot of it was this hatred of not just Hillary Clinton, but the liberal establishment and people in the media on the East Coast and the West Coast. You know, they just didn't think they got that part of America anymore. They thought their culture was under threat. They thought their economic livelihoods were under threat. They felt like economic castaways, not just in a globalized economy, but in a digitized economy. And Donald Trump to them seemed like a national savior. Mm -hmm. But of course, his success in 2016 was not, uh, in the end, decided by how many people voted for him, but where they voted for him and the structure of the Electoral College. Um, I mean, there, there is a sense here that we're talking about a country that isn't, in a strict sense, a democracy, if you mean one person's vote has equal value wherever they are in the United States. Well, this is where we're into your territory, David, in Empire of Liberty. And, you know, you describe very wonderfully how America was never a mass democracy. It was always a representative democracy. And in looking at the traceable origins of Donald Trump, I mean, I said you could go back to the Revolutionary yeah. War, you could also go back to the Constitutional Convention. I mean, I think both of us would agree, and I think it's a widely held view that the the Electoral College was not the founding fathers' greatest, finest hour. Um, you know, they came up with this mechanism um, that 200 plus years on just doesn't look like a fantastic way of conducting an election. And moreover, I mean, as you know, and I, you, you speak about this fantastically in the book. I mean, the, the Constitution has come to be regarded as this sacred text of almost biblical ta tablets that can't really be changed. But the Constitution and the way that it's given rural states um, more representation than they, they have, it has created a kind of uh, a Capitol Hill where the Senate obviously is a bulwark against change, as traditionally it's blocked things like civil rights legislation and universal health care, all those kind of things. Um, they created a House of Representatives where people have to seek re-election every two years, which fuels this permanent campaign dynamic in, in Washington there. Um, 
you know, a lot of problems stem from a, from a flawed document. I mean, the founding fathers regarded it as an experiment in democracy, an experiment that would have to be changed over the time. But a lot of it has actually sort of survived. And, and the mechanics, the constitutional mechanics, especially as they pertain to elections, um, you know, many people would look at now and, and say, you know, that's just not fit for purpose anymore. Yes, they would. But what I'm wondering about, and I've been thinking about it again, rewriting the book, is that you, you, I mean, you've got a number of ways in which the founders decided they did not want a democracy. Um, so that, for example, you have a Senate where uh, every state, regardless of size, is represented equally. Um, you've got the um, uh, the, the, the problem of, of, of constitutional amendment, which is extraordinarily difficult um, uh, in terms of what is it? You need um, a, a, a majority of the um, of both houses and three quarters of the states. Um, but of course, the point of, of those restrictions was because right from the beginning, they were trying to defend certain kinds of minority rights or vested interests. Initially, the whole question of slave owners and their, their rights. But what I wonder about is that maybe that, that those problems, those what we see as structural problems with the constitution are actually almost essential to hold a country the size of a continent together in any kind of way, that there has to be, if you like, the price of union is almost injustice. That seems to me to be a pattern of American history. And I wonder if it's actually still what's going to be the case in the future. It's the price, the price of union. The price of union is, is dysfunction. Yeah, no, I, dysfunction I, I, and also in, injustice. It's not going to be, um, you know, a protection for um, the rights of of what seem to be the majority. It's a protection for the rights of the minority. Yeah, uh, I mean that's part of the problem. Um, the contradictions of American history have never been resolved, and the founding fathers created a constitutional catch twenty two. Um, they accepted that that document would be open to change, but they made it notoriously hard to change. Mm. And so many of the problems that you look at now, whether it's still states, I mean, even in the midst of COVID, for instance, you know, states competing against each other, states having a, an antagonistic relationship with the federal government in Washington. Obviously the racial problems that still dog this country. I mean, so many of them are out the historical contradictions of America that have never been resolved. Um, you know, the fact that the Declaration of Independence was written by the same person that wrote a scientific defense of, of slavery. You know, the fact that George Washington was a slave owner, the fact that Thomas Jefferson was a slave owner. So much of this history is still live. So much of this history is still contentious. And so many of this history is still unresolved. And I think one of the problems right now is I just can't see how that history ever gets resolved anymore. Um, I think that was why a lot of people ended up being disappointed by the Obama administration, because rather than sort of bringing uh, America closer together on the racial front, America arguably became more racialized, which partly explains why the next president was the untitled leader of the Bertha movement, somebody who'd made Obama's race so central to his candidacy. And now I kind of, have a very pessimistic take. I love America like you do. I, I love this land, but the book does become a lament because I just don't see how these divides are bridged anymore. I, I see, a, I mean, we've spoken throughout the century of a post-American world and my worry at the moment is we're living in a post-America America. It's totally unrecognizable for the country that I fell in love with and you fell in love with. And I don't see how that country comes back together anymore. And part of the reason for that is that these historical dilemmas, these American dilemmas, have never been adequately resolved. Well, I agree with that. And I agree with, you know, that the, the United States has never coped, if you like, with the original sin in which it was born, the sin of slavery. But I then wonder, and this is where I want to widen this out a bit, you know, part of 
the challenge of America is that you, anybody, can report it, analyze it, comment on its uh, its flaws, its problems, as well as its virtues, incessantly. It's such an open society. Most countries have problems, huge problems, with their history and their legacies. And one of the things, you know, at the moment, the, the comparison now, it was, it's no longer America and Soviet Union, it's America and China. Um, and, you know, there's a sense, well, by 2050, China will have got through, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a massive program of ro uh, world development. Uh, China's got a leader for life and all the rest of it. China's a really, is sitting, the Chinese leadership is sitting on a time bomb. You know, the party is corrupt. The, the levels of, of protest that are simmering, you, you can see this is not going to last indefinitely. And, and part of what I feel in a way is that because we can see so clearly the flaws in America, because it's such an open society, we fail to appreciate that most countries have, uh, you know, their history is ti a, a time bomb. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the, the rise of China is fascinating. I think it does pose a threat to American preeminence in a way that other countries haven't. I mean, you know, the Soviet Union had the population, it didn't have the system. Japan had the system, it didn't have the population. You know, a view has taken hold in the early part of this century, which was reinforced in the early days of COVID when you saw the mobilization that China managed to put into place around the pandemic, the, you know, the idea that China has both, you know, this, this yeah. system and this population. And it does pose a threat. I mean, my worry, I mean, I came, to America as a 16 year old because I, I thought America was the future. Um, I wonder now if you're a 16 year old growing up in Britain, whether you see China as the future and, and China as the country to emulate. And I think that would be a great tragedy, obviously given their human rights record and given oh. the, the fact that, you know, my colleagues in, in Beijing and, and in Shanghai obviously operate under very different rules yes. than I do and what they can and can't report and can't report to a, to a large extent. Um, but the problem is, I just don't see America as that, you know, shining city on a hill anymore in the same way that I did as a kid. And I think part of the problem is not just America's failure to resolve its historical contradictions. My worry right now, David, is, is there isn't even a shared set of facts anymore in America. There are two separate realities in America. There aren't just two separate histories. There are two separate day-to-day -day realities. You know, the we haven't just faced a pandemic over the last year, we've faced an infodemic. Um, yeah. All the conspiracy theories that have sort of metastasized online. You know, even a clear cut election ended up being contested because so many people came to believe these mistruths and conspiracy theories that the election had been stolen. You know, I was with Trump two weeks ago in Florida and they still believe that the election was stolen. It was clear cut. We both know it, everybody knows it but there is still this belief that it was stolen. And that speaks of these sort of, you know, a battle not only over America's history right now, but a battle over, over American reality. And that's really problematic. And again, I just don't see how that, that gulf gets bridged. Okay, so let's, let's take some of, you know, your pessimism and let's just perhaps finish by trying to talk that through and whether there's, um, there's alternatives. Um, there's a sort of assumption, I think, often that great events need uh, to have great causes to explain them. If there's been something cataclysmic, it must be due to cataclysmic forces that have developed over time. So, for example, over the First World War, you know, debates, well, known is this because of, you know, long term rivalries over colonies or arms races or whatever. But equally, there is a view and I don't think historians resolve it at all. You know, actually. A, a, a small number of people in the summer of 1914 just blew it. I mean, they just really took their eyes off the ball. They didn't see what was going on. And then there was this. <gasps> Oh my God. And it's quite striking. Many of those people who, who, who you know, handled that crisis had nervous breakdowns and uh, afterwards, and several of them just you know, went to their graves still asking, what did I do? Anyway, what I'm saying is this, um, the trigger for your book in a way, and the trigger for you know, my rewriting is just this feeling, oh, 
Trump, this is, you know, how do we explain it? We must dig back into 30, 40, 50 years of American history or whatever. Yet, one of the things that's striking about your book is actually that it brings out very well just what a political genius Trump was. Not a stable genius in that famous phrase, but that he just had this incredible sense of political management. And in particular, you, know, you say this, you know, this combination of Twitter in the morning, a, a, a major television appearance after, afterwards uh, in the afternoon, um, making the news, making the noise, and as you say, this ratcheting up of every day, sort of perpetual sense of anxiety, of crisis. Um, he's the oxygen, he sucks everything in. And um, you said yourself, and it's noticeable, once he's gone, and we have someone who might be regarded as a normal president, the level of, of intensity of politics goes down. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm slightly skeptical about this sense that we need big structural explanations for everything. Another example would be Milosevic in, in former Yugoslavia. You know, it's generally said, ah, after the Cold War, the, the um, you know, the, the frozen uh, nationalism that was under the surface, it thawed out. And that's what was going, what broke up Yugoslavia. What broke up Yugoslavia was that Milosevic was a communist who was looking around for something else to legitimize him himself. And he said, we'll play the nationalist card, the Serbian nationalist card. So my question to you in a way is, if we take Trump out, do we perhaps have a little more space to cool it, to avoid the intensity of the partisanship? Um, do you see, in other words, what's happened in the last month or so since you, the last couple of months since you finished the book, do you see that as hopeful or, or not? Yeah, a lot to unpack there. I totally agree with you about the danger of a, a historical form of reverse engineering. When you sort of look at the final product and then you try and build the parts yeah. that, that made the final product. <clears throat> I hopefully have avoided that. I do think there were big forces at play with Trump, political, economic, technological, residential, sociological, cultural, um, psychological, you know, just something as simple as the normalization of narcissism, you know, helped pave the way for Donald Trump. Um, you know, when he said the American dream is dead, you know, loads of people believed him. Politically, the Republican Party had almost become the anti-Obama party. So it made sense for them to go for the most virulently anti-Obama candidate. You know, what were we watching on TV, reality TV, um, technologically, Twitter, Facebook, gave him all these weapons that he could use and also weapons that the Russians could use. That was a big factor in 2016. Um, I totally agree with you about the impact of personality on history. It's not just about historical forces, it's about personalities. And I think one of the great strengths of Donald Trump over the years was his brilliance at managing to personify the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times. You know, if you accept the idea, and I don't necessarily, that decades have characters, then Donald Trump managed to personify every single decade from the 80s onwards. In the 1980s, he literally became um, more of uh, a representation of Reagan and Reaganism than Reagan himself. You know, Trump now became the ultimate totem of 1980s America. That sort of greed is good the uh, ethos. You know, the 90s were a very tabloid decade. We didn't just have Clinton and Monica. We had all sorts of tabloid scandals. You know, Donald Trump at that stage became this tabloid fixture. You know, the best sex I've ever had, Martha Maples, front page, New York Daily News and New York Post, that kind of thing. He really became a tabloid guy in a tabloid age. In the turn of the century, reality TV kicks in. That's the dominant cultural um, force in American entertainment. Trump becomes a reality TV star. And then after the financial crisis of 2008, the Great Recession, grievance and fear becomes so central to the American experience. And Donald Trump becomes a cipher for that. And in many ways, he personifies that. And I think his, his brilliance at sort of shape-shifting is part of his appeal and explains why this paradox, you know, the, the, the New York billionaire becomes the working class hero and the vigilante president. Um, and the last point you raised was about the chance of union, the chance that Biden can bring about a more sensible politics and a more bipartisan politics. Yeah, someone who's not politicizing the presidency every day. Yeah, and this idea that a boring presidency is good for America. Um, 
And, you know, as a journalist, it really does feel like having been an all night rave for four years and coming home and turning on classic FM. <laughs> My colleague John Sobel said it's a bit like being on crack cocaine and then having a half a glass of shandy. I, I wouldn't know, but uh, that's up to you and John. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't, I can't, I can, I can vouch for the half glass of shandy. We used to drink it after football matches at, at Churchill. Um, the, where is the hope? Where is the hope? Um, there hasn't been much bipartisanship so far. You'd have thought that a rescue package in the midst of an economic crisis might attract some Republican support. It hasn't. I think Biden is very aware that, you know, you're going to get the same obstructionism that he experienced as a vice president under Obama as the president now in the Oval Office. Um, you know, where's America going economically? I worry about the impact of AI. I worry about uh, white collar jobs being decimated in the same way that blue collar jobs were decimated. I mean, Trump claimed that all those jobs in the Rust Belt had gone because of immigration, but they went because of machines. I mean, he, his right. candidacy was a, really a revolt against robots. It, it was, he just repurposed it as a revolt against immigration. Um, as America moves towards a majority minority country, you worry about a backlash, um, a white backlash against that. You look at the new generation of politicians coming along. I think it's heartening that a lot of 9-11 generation Americans are, are becoming lawmakers now. Because I talk in the book, and as you know, I mean, one of the great things about the greatest generation, the, the generation that fought in the war, was they had this great sense of patriotic bipartisanship. They had fought real wars, so they didn't go to Washington to fight these political wars. They acted in a spirit of, of bipartisanship. And unfortunately, now the baby boomer generation has taken over, and their formative political years were in the tumultuous years of the 60s, the values developed and those culture wars continue to play out now. I do think there is hope in that 9-11 generation. You saw a lot of military people getting elected in the midterms, get re-elected in last year's presidential election as well. Maybe they will bring about a more sensible dialogue in Washington. But again, you know, I go back to this point. You would have thought that something like COVID-19 would bring this country together. A national calamity on this scale, more than 500,000 people have, have died, but instead, COVID has ended up being an accelerant of polarization. People cannot even agree anymore on something as simple as a face mask. So your evaluation of this is a country that's lost its greatness. What is greatness? What do you mean by greatness? Because I get the sense reading the book that you don't really grapple with that. And yet it's the central concept. What does that mean for you, a great country? Yeah, it's what a real. The, what are the marks of a great country? I do talk about it in the book, but in a very kind of as I bring the book to the end, you know, what is American greatness? And of course, this was the genius of Donald Trump when he said, "Let's make America great again." He actually didn't specify when America was great. Uh, he was a revivalist that didn't actually say precisely what he was trying to revive. And the political genius of that, obviously, was that people could create their own kingdoms of their mind. For some people, American greatness meant the 1950s, but as both of us know, and as everybody knows, I mean, African Americans at that time did not have a full menu of civil rights. You know, there were a lot of, uh, some people thought he was referring to greatness in the, in the early 70s, you know, before automation had killed off all those jobs. Some people thought it was greatness in the 90s when America enjoyed this period of, of peace and stability and prosperity after the end of the Cold War. But, um, I mean, the, the idea of greatness I think is often weighed down by the contradictions of American history that we have spoken about. When can you pinpoint a moment of greatness when all Americans- but What does it mean, that word? I mean, what does it mean for you? You use it in the title of your book. American greatness for me always meant a sense of possibility and a sense of opportunity and a, a sense of possibility and a sense of opportunity for all. And I think that has been the problem with the American story, that they've never reached the point where that was true for everybody, whether it was racially, um, whether it was for women, um, whether it was for immigrants. And that has been a recurring problem of the American story. And every um, country's story. And every country's story, I absolutely agree, but not every country makes the same pretentious claims to right. break in America. Not every country has the same rhetoric of American exceptionalism. I, you know, I argue in the book that now American exceptionalism really is a negative. We associate it with mass shootings. We don't look to emulate America. We look to, we don't turn out like America. That mind shift 
from the mid 80s has, has been been dramatic. Look, I do see American greatness in, in common endeavors. I see American greatness in the bravery of the civil rights movement. I see it in the feminist movement. I see it in the mission to get somebody on the moon, that scientific achievement. I saw it in that multiracial team of athletes getting all those gold medals in 1984 with the whole of the country, it seemed, enjoying it. It was a patriotic surge. It wasn't a nationalistic surge. It felt joyous. It didn't felt, feel threatening. Um, the I, Russian uh, uh, boycott did as well, so. Yeah. No, the boycott was an enormous, you know, I don't think McDonald's planned their scratch card promotion no. before the boycott happened, but I, I see greatness in those collective endeavours. I mean, right. yeah. Okay, well, we need to wind up in a, a moment because we want to give a little bit of time for questions, but um, hopefully this has given people a bit of a flavour of the book. Um, there are other things we haven't managed to talk about. I would love to have discussed more with Nick what actually happened when he and Melania and Donald were in the Best Western Hotel in Manchester, New Hampshire in 2016. But, well, you'll have to read the book to find out. Uh, anyway, Richard, I think you're going to take us into some questions now. I am. Thank you both very much. That was uh, terrific. And we've got some really excellent questions. One um, takes us back to the start of the discussion, but also um, uh, captures the conclusion too. And it's a very specific question addressed to both of you, really. When you were first in America and you had that extraordinary sense of possibility, would that sense of possibility have been in the minds and hearts of African-Americans as well, do you think? When I was there... Uh, when you were there, back in, back in the day, in 1984. No, no, it, it, it wouldn't have been. Um, and I talk in the book about how, you know, Los Angeles becomes a metaphor in many ways, and, and that joy that I experienced in 1984. And there was this, you know, it was a multiracial team of athletes. You know, you remember people like Carl Lewis, uh, Michael Jordan was a young basketball player in the goal winning team back then. You know, there was this sort of universal... Um, delight in America's success amongst Americans, and it was a multiracial success. But I talk, as I enter the Bush years, and I was a student in, in America, um, I talk about how the City of Angels was aflame after the Rodney King beating, um, and how, you know, the, the problems of race were just flagrantly there. And, yeah, I mean... You know, my background, my PhD was all about the struggle for black equality and the failure of the Kennedy administration really to seize upon a historic opportunity at the beginning of the 60s to bring about a more peaceful transition to an equitable society. Kennedy delayed civil rights. That led African-Americans to demand things like reparations and affirmative action, which white America never agreed with. And it also encouraged segregationists in the South to be more defiant. And that created a lot of the climactic battles of the 60s, which meant that that moment of a possible peaceful transition had gone. So I'm very aware of the racial problems. And what, what makes me depressed to this day, I mean, I, you know, if you looked out of my window six months ago, every day you would have seen 20,000 African-Americans marching across Brooklyn Bridge in protest of the George Floyd killing. And, you know, that original sin is still there. It's still live. It's still you know, the angriest fault line in American society. Yeah, for me, the, um, the sense of possibility was simply a comparative one, as it were, what it was like to be in America as opposed to being in, in Britain. Uh, uh, I don't uh, think that it, it had the same impact, it would have conceivably had the same effect on uh, African-Americans, because by then there was, I think, a general sense already of, of disillusion in the wake of the assassination of Martin Luther King, the riots and things like that. And what's striking, we're talking about Obama and of course now Kamala Harris. Um, these, if you like, are the faces of America's future of a mixed race country. By 2050, it will be, before 2050, uh, whites in the, the quote, pure sense, will be a minority in the United States. But the, the, the people who are, if you like, the um, flag bearers for this uh, more mixed race society are not those who've come up from slavery, if you like, the, the veterans of the civil rights movement and their descendants. It's uh, these more um, exotically multicultural uh, non-white Americans. Um, and that, of course, is, is, was challenged by Obama to the civil rights leadership or 
the form of civil rights. But there's something very poignant about that, I find. They're both, to me, hopeful figures, yet they almost, it's like they've missed, they, they go around the old problem. So that would be my answer. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, there's a lot of interest in the question of bipartisanship um, and apparent faith on the part of the Democrats in bipartisanship and uh, people wonder where that comes from. Um, and uh, where does it lie in the face of uh, a Republican attitude now, which seems to be dead set against bipartisanship because they're so focused upon uh, stealing everything for themselves? Well, historically speaking, bipartisanship was a real feature of the early post-war years. The schisms within American politics weren't between the parties, they're within the parties. You had the Democratic Party being this strange amalgam between racist segregationists in the South and Northern progressives. The Republican Party was uh, internationalists against isolationists. And then the Big Bang moment, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, what you got was an ideological sorting. And a lot of the Southern Democrats joined the Republican Party. You had this historically anomalous idea that the solid Democratic South would become reliably Republican in presidential and congressional elections. You just had the, the whole political geography and the landscape just, just shifted very dramatically. And that was a big bang moment in polarization. Um, so too was the end of the Cold War. The Cold War had imposed a great discipline on American uh, politicians to act in the national interest. Um, and that, the end of the Cold War, the fall of the Berlin Wall, also coincided with this generational shift that I was talking about earlier. The greatest generation didn't hand the torch to the next, the baby boomers. They had it wrenched away from them. People like Newt Gingrich came up, Bill Clinton came up. He brought his war room philosophy from Little Rock to the White House. And that spirit of bipartisanship ended. And what we started to see was some of the constitutional and parliamentary checks and balances used as weapons and vetoes. You know, the filibuster gets used a lot, lot more. Um, you get, uh, uh, the, the, there isn't that spirit of cooperation that had been such a marked characteristic of the 1950s and to a certain extent the 60s. I mean, the Civil Rights Act actually had more Republican senators vote for it than Democratic senators. Um, you just don't get that sort of spirit of cooperation anymore. Let me, uh, let me comment on the question more specifically with regard to recent events. One of the things I found in re writing this new chapter of the book was I spent a lot of time trying to understand Mitch McConnell because Mitch McConnell, the Republican leader in the Senate, has been absolutely crucial to blocking Obama. And despite his clear contempt for Trump in the uh, early stages of the primaries, basically supporting the Trump presidency. Uh, Trump would have not been, I think, nearly so successful if uh, O'Connell had took a different attitude. On the 6th of January, as the crowd are literally breaking in to the, the Capitol, um, and uh, it's clear something has gone devastatingly wrong, McConnell says, uh, it's interesting, I just let me read it to you just quickly, he said, this election was not uniquely close. The electoral college margins are roughly the same as 2016. Um, he said, if, if we keep on contesting elections in this way, it will be impossible to have any changes of power. And then he says, and I comment on this as a, a flash of, a rare flash of statesmanship, McConnell uh, uh, warned that, um, uh, he said, we cannot keep drifting apart into two separate tribes with separate sets of facts and separate realities with nothing in common except our hostility towards each other and towards uh, the institutions we have in common. Now, of course, McConnell voted against um, uh, impeachment of Trump and all the rest of it. But there was just this sense for a moment that somebody was who had been crucial in the whole story of Obama and Trump uh, was saying, maybe there's a point now that it's gone too far. Uh, and I, I, uh, McConnell is an enigma to me. Um, in the end, you know, he's easy to read as a straightforwardly cynical politician who says what is necessary at particular times. But that was, as I said, for me, a rare flash of statesmanship. But I think, yeah, yeah sorry. Sorry, David, I just had the, the postscript to that. It was an amazing speech. I think all of us were 
blown away by it. But of course, it came after a vote to acquit Trump. I think on the eve of CPAC, you saw a very different Mitch McConnell. He was asked whether he would support Donald Trump's candidacy in the 2024 election. He said, of course he would. He would back him. I mean, it's always been about packing the federal judiciary with conservatives for McConnell, of course, and Trump became a really useful vehicle for that. And what struck me about the uh, being in CPAC, the conservative conference with Trump a couple of weeks ago, was it was almost as if January the 6th had never happened for the conservative movement. It wasn't seen by them as a pivotal moment. It wasn't seen as a moment to repudiate Donald Trump. There was a straw poll. He is still the dominant figure. Um, he is still the leader of the Republican Party. The party of Ronald Reagan has become the party of Donald Trump. And it's certainly not the party of Mitch McConnell and certainly not the party of Mitch McConnell's words that day. Which takes me on to uh, another question that people have raised, really, which is, um, has all of this hollowed out the Republican Party as, a, as an electoral, for electoral force? I mean, if Mitch McConnell was looking into the abyss at that moment when he made the speech, and, 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 and that's why he made the speech, was he right to see an abyss there? Without Trump, does the Republican Party in its current form have a future? And if so, what future? The problem for the Republican Party right now is Donald Trump's bigger than the Republican Party. Um, I think it's striking historically, actually, you know, we used to talk about the GOP, the grand old party, it, that term doesn't get used that much anymore. Mm. Because I think, you know, that anchor has just been wrenched up. And, you know, does, uh, and it's a, a Trumpian future that it looks like for the Republican Party at the moment. Nikki Haley, who is a very ambitious politician from South Carolina, UN ambassador, very telegenic, could be the first female president. You know, she kind of tried to distance herself from Donald Trump. Um, and then kind of backtrack because she knew that's where the base is right now. That is where the money is right now. That is where the energy in the party is right now. That is where a lot of the caucus is right now. Even after January the 6th, when their own lives were in danger, almost half of the Republican lawmakers on Capitol Hill returned to the chambers that night and voted to overturn Donald, um, Joe Biden's victory. That is where the Republican Party is right now. It is a Trumpian movement. And is that enough to provide it with a political future, Nick? Because it, the base doesn't command a majority in America. No, but it, it gives him the chance to win the Republican presidential nomination again, for sure. And I don't think you can rule out the possibility that he could run nationally in 2024 and win again. I, I just don't think you, we just never know what's going to happen economically. We're never going to know what happens with the coronavirus. You know, there are so many moving parts. Um, but can you rule out the possibility of somebody winning who won 74 million votes and got 25 states being viable in four years? Of course you can't. He is viable. Okay, so final question, because I'm conscious of the clock. Yeah. Um, can we focus on Trump just a little bit? Because both of you, in different ways, talked about Trump's political genius, genius maybe a kind of naive political genius, but a political genius, a, a capacity to connect. Um, and uh, people are interested in, in the question of how far initially his initial successes um, in, in, the in the electoral process were really all about the Steve Bannon playbook, whether actually somebody else was setting the agenda. Um, and there's a connected question, which is, could Trump have done it? And you, you've sort of partially answered this already, but could he have done it without social media? Was, is that sort of, was that sort of presidency a possibility before social media? Um, on the Steve Bannon question, I mean, it's worth pointing out that actually the rise of Donald Trump predated Steve Bannon coming and joining his campaign. It's only fairly late on that Steve Bannon came and got involved. You know, Paul Manafort had been his campaign manager early on. He didn't really have a, much of a campaign team at all. I mean, again, it showed his own political skill and his own media smarts, the fact that he could become this ringmaster of the media circus and we would all go to his preferences and we would give him this acres of airtime. Um, uh, as the, the, the second, sorry, Richard, the second point was... So, so the second point really was about the viability of a, of a Trumpian presidency without social media. I mean, of course, we all know that there were candidates in the, in the much deeper American past who were, who were arch populists. Trump was the first one to deliver. Yeah, I, I still think we're still getting to grips with the massive way that the internet has changed the whole political landscape. It's interesting if you look at the literature around the internet 20 years ago, it was all about how we would create these online spaces where everybody would come together. There would be these civic town hall meetings where, you know, we'd, we'd resolve our differences in a very kind of decent and, and honest way. And of course, the complete opposite has happened. I mean, arguably the, the, the 
the internet has created this great cancerous growth in in the American body politic. And uh, yeah, social media has been a big part of that. But I, I don't see what David David thinks. Either. Well, I mean, just to go on. I mean, clearly he he part of getting the the uh, nomination and uh, probably the presidency was the degree to which he manipulated social media and that you know, that one man media conglomerate that Nick was talking about. But what I what struck me writing the book was actually the 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 the, the hard work that he actually put in. It was, uh, you know, all Republican candidates from Reagan onwards have doffed their hats to evangelical Protestants. Um, the evangelical Protestants said Trump was the first one, first president to invite them into the White House and to do so on a regular basis. And so you had these bizarre images of Trump, you know, in a prayer breakfast with people's hands on him and so on. And you think to yourself, I mean, this is not a churchgoer. This is a man whose, um, you know, um, private life is, is not exactly, um, you know, a model of, of um, uh, you know, traditional Christian morality, but he courted that base he delivered on something that all presidents had said recently, you know, in recent presidents had said about moving the, uh, you know, the embassy to Jerusalem, um, which matters not so much to Jews, but it matters to evangelical Protestants because it's the uh, sign of the second coming, of the imminence of the second coming. Um, so he delivers on something like that. He works really hard at it. Same with the legal profession. I mean, Trump really keeps his ear to the Federalist Society, which is the Republican conservative network. And he basically, all those three nominations come straight from what the Federalist Society want in terms of justices. So this is a man who's savvy and diligent in a way that doesn't fit this image of the kind of cavalier guy you know, sitting there and just tweeting his uh, his message in the morning. There's a lot more to that man than, um, you know, I certainly took seriously to begin with. And that, of course, is why Nick is saying, you know, we can't um, we can't rule him out. But it, to me, it also reinforces my question. Is there anybody who could do it in the way that Trump could do it? You know, uh, uh, you know whether it's Nikki Haley, whether it's uh, you know one of the the, the the Trump boys and so on. You know, that's part of my, um, if you like, grudging respect for him. It's the feeling then that, uh, as a phenomenon, political phenomenon, it's also the feeling that maybe take him out of the equation. And I don't think even Trump is going to live forever. You know, something may change. But there we are. We're talking about the future, and as a historian, I'm pretty bad on the future. You know, so. <laughs> Nick, a final comment from you on that? Oh, look, I think there'll only be one Donald Trump, and uh, yeah, I, nobody can replicate Donald Trump. Um, he's an American first and an American original. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, on that note, can I thank you both um, hugely again? A wonderfully energizing, dynamic, um, uh, so engaging discussion and, and uh, although much of the subject matter was um, depressing I, I feel strangely uplifted by the whole thing so um, thank you both uh, hugely again I'm sure everyone feels exactly the same way and I'd like to thank everybody in the audience for coming I hope you've really enjoyed it um, uh, go safely everyone stay safe thank you thank you thanks Richard